Our next speaker is Roy Schwaber Cohen from Pinecone, also one of the sponsors. Thank you very much, Pinecone. Yeah. And he's talking about long term memory. I asked for his uh, phrase that pays, and he said, I'm an AI advocate rep that represents him the best. So, welcome to the stage, Roy. Thank you so much. And it's, it's R O I E. R O I E. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, it is. It's not Roy. It's not Roy. <laughs> it's Roy E. All right. You got All it. All right. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Roy Schwaber Cohen, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, retrieval augmented generation with Pinecone. So I'm a staff, a staff developer advocate at Pinecone. I've uh, been there for almost a year. Very excited to talk to you guys about this, um, this subject. Um, a lot of people are asking us about uh, retrieval augmented generation, or RAG for short. Um, it's definitely been a very um, hot topic um, online as well. Um, but I wanted to start with kind of like setting the stage up a little bit and kind of level setting um, and talking about the sort of fundamentals of how AI thinks, um, what are those building blocks that, that make up uh, uh, the way that L, the, the internal representations of LLMs and other um, uh, deep learning models. I'm going to talk about vector databases, of course. And, and walk through some application architectures that, that vector databases, uh, applications that use vector databases uh, apply. And then um, for the second half of the talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, RAG and hopefully uh, go through some tips and tricks that um, I hope would be um, helpful to you in your RAG journey. So we'll start with how AI thinks. So as we all know, AI is sort of a mimic of uh, the way that human beings think. They're, it's obviously not, um, uh, the same, but there, there are a lot of uh, interesting similarities. Uh, basically, as we all know, a lot of these models are neural networks that consist uh, layers of interconnected neurons or artificial neurons that are arranged in these layers. Um, and the way that we uh, create these uh, models is by uh, showing immense amounts of data to these networks um, that then adjust the connections bet between those artificial neurons. And then once these uh, models are trained, they're capable of extracting these high-level features um, from the data and then make uh, precisions and decisions based on that, uh, on that training data. Now, the, the, the features themselves are represented internally as vectors in high-dimensional space, and that means they basically are very long lists of numbers. Um, and these vectors are also known, at, known as embeddings, and we'll talk about why uh, these are called embeddings in a second. So basically embeddings are these numerical re representations that capture the relationships between discrete, discrete objects, like words, like documents, paragra paragraphs and documents, like images, etc. And they take these relationships as they exist in their original space, like for example, the, 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 semantic space, the semantic space, and they project it into vector space. So now they're represented as numbers. The important thing that embeddings do is that they preserve those relationships, thus they preserve the meaning that, be, that exists in within those relationships between those discrete objects. So, it's kind of impossible to really visualize embeddings because they are these high dimensional mathematical objects. Uh, but this is sort of a very simplified uh, representation um, that kind of like gives us an intuition about how these embeddings work. So in this, in this visualization, what we see is this cloud of terms right here in, in these blue dots, and then this, this cluster of yellow dots that represent semantically rel related terms. In this case, these are the days of the week. And that's what we actually see within these high dimensional vector spaces when we have a lot of embeddings. The terms that have some correlation and some similarity to one another in the semantic space, meaning that they have some relationship that is, that is similar in the semantic space, are going to be represented as being geometrically close to one another um, in high dimensional vector space. Now, these um, meanings don't just come from the surface form, form itself of whatever word that we're trying to embed, but rather from the greater context of the term, right, that we're, that we're um, looking at. And this will come in, uh, uh, into action later on when I actually show how this works in practice. But here we can look at these three sentences that each use the word bank, 
but the meaning of the word bank is influenced by the context in which it, it is found. So we have where is the Bank of England and where is the grassy bank and how does the plain bank? All of these use the word bank, but because the context d makes the meaning of the word bank, bank different in each case, in the embedding space, we'll find, but we'll find the embedding farther away, for, far away from, from the other instances. And conversely, if we have two sentences that use completely different surface forms, like the bees decided to have a mutiny against their queen and flying stinging insects, insects, insects rebelled in opposition to the matriarch, they, these two use completely different surface form but mean very much the same thing. These two sentences are going to be represented close together in the uh, high dimensional embedding, embedding space. So moving on to what a vector database is. So, a vector database, as the name suggests, allows us to manage vectors, like embeddings, but not only embeddings, and the, it allows us to do that at scale, right? So there are many ways of handling embeddings. You could, like very famous, famously, Andrew Karpathy, I think, uh, said this on, on Twitter, you could use NumPy, right, to like have all, your, all, all of your embeddings in, in memory. You could use things like Feist and, and other algorithms that kind of live all in memory to manage your embeddings. The goal of the vector database is to do this at scale and to give you all of the uh, uh, creature comforts that you get from a traditional database. And that means that it's easy to insert, it's easy to update, it's easy to delete, and regardless of the size of your index, it's going to be performant, right? Now, the way that vector databases work that is unlike other, other databases is that, again, it uses vectors as its core representations. And so if we want to interact with a, with a vector database, what we will use to query the vector, da vector database is a vector. So we'll, we will give the database a vector and we will get back similar vectors based on, on the query vector that we, uh, that we used. And the last thing that a vector database does that differentiates it from other methods like FICE and others is that it allows us to associate metadata to our vectors. And that comes in, um, as a very critically important and helpful thing um, in the context of RAG, and we'll see that in a moment. So, as I mentioned before, AI models are these compact representations um, of, of, these, of this like massively uh, trained data set, right, that, that becomes, in, in, becomes this model that ends up being sort of a black box. So when we ask a question of these uh, neural nets, we get back a response, but we don't necessarily know why the response was the way that it was. And so in some ways, we can think of vector databases as allowing us to peer into what uh, machine learning models and neural networks actually are doing in, in, inside. And the way we do that is by saving those, in, those internal representations in the vector database and then associating them with this handle, with this metadata and, and in that way, we can say, okay, so this internal representation is, is actually associated with a structured amount of data that is trusted and known by us and is no longer something that we sort of, quote, unquote, trust the model to give us. And in this way, we sort of give a path to um, uh, get to uh, an explainable kind of solution where instead of, again, just getting back a result from, from our model, we can associate the, the, the result with some, again, structured data that we have said as, as the developers that it is trusted and known to us and, and trackable in, in, a, in, a, in a, a, a structured way. So Pinecone um, is the company that I represent. It is a high-performance vector database, a cloud-first and, and vector-native uh, uh, database. Uh, it's a fully managed and distributed vector database. So the goal of, of Pinecone specifically is to ensure that you can start with working with it with uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of embeddings, but you can also grow to hundreds of millions and billions of embeddings without worrying about scaling the vector database um, and, and, and uh, how it will perform under those, uh, uh, under those conditions. Um, we also ensure that your query latency is as low as it could be, um, and it is, in most cases, sub-100 millisecond uh, query, query uh, result. 
And of course, we make sure that the, the, uh, the cost is optimized as much as possible so you don't have to uh, pay through the nose to actually get uh, these systems going. Okay, next I'm gonna talk about um, the uh, overall, uh, uh, basically an example of an, ex uh, of a, of an application that uses a vector, a vector database. Um, in this case, it's a semantic search engine. Um, and this is the way that, it, that it's set up. We usually have a dual path that usually starts with our content that we want to uh, uh, embed and we want to be able to search over. We're going to use an embedding model um, to create the embeddings for that content. We're going to associate that embedded content with metadata and insert it into a vector database. And then when it's time to use this data, the application is going to take the query embed the query with the same model that was used to uh, embed the content in the first place. We again get a, a vector embedding. We use the API to now query the vector database and then we get back a result that contains both the embeddings, <laughs> the, the vector embeddings and the metadata associated with those vector embeddings. Now, of course, you can use all sorts of features <laughs> that uh, Pinecone and other vector database allow you to use on top of this uh, within, the, within the, the context of the API, for example, uh, filtering and, and namespaces that kind of allows you to hone in exactly on the subset of uh, vectors that are applicable and are relevant for your search. Okay, so now it's time to talk about RAG. Um, and this is like the, the reason why we're all here. So generative AI models, as we've all heard, um, are incredibly powerful. Um, they're, in, they're also incredible, incredibly versatile. You can use them to generate images. You can use them to, to generate music. You can obviously use them to generate text. But they have this one crucial hole, which is they're limited by the training data that was, that the, that, that was used to, to, to create them in the first place. And so if we are trying to interact with those uh, models and we're trying to ask them about things that are outside of that training data, we're gonna hit a roadblock. And that mostly manifests in the way of hallucination. Um, and that is, the model just starts talking about things as if it knows the answer, but it definitely doesn't know the answer. So it starts inventing things, right? And we can tell that those things are untrue, but, un but the, 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 biggest, the biggest problem is that we don't want our customers to run into that, in that situation and kind of come into contact with uh, information that is not relevant and not correct for them. So vector databases can mitigate this problem, so they can't solve it completely, um, unfortunately, at the moment, but they can definitely mitigate it, mitigate it to a very great degree, um, to the point where we can make these LLMs actually work in production situations without worrying too much, right, they were going to show results that are completely fabricated. And the way that uh, vector, vector databases apply in this case is, again, based on the fact that we're all talking about embeddings. Now, why is that important? Generative AI uh, LLMs, basically, are, all live in, in, the, in this world of se the semantic space where people are giving us their questions as a free-form natural language kind of input, right? It could have this ambiguity. In most cases, it has this ambiguity within it, right? Pretty, pretty much uh, assured, right, that we have to overcome, right? So we can't just take that query and use it against, say, a SQL database or a, an Elasticsearch and hope that something hits. Because in most cases, either our users don't really know what they're looking for or they're not going to very, be, be very precise about the way that they're going to search for those terms. They're actually trying to just speak their minds and write as naturally as possible. And so we want to bridge that gap right, and allow them to do that. But at the same time, you want to be able to correlate their queries with something that is structured, trusted, and known to us to be correct. And that's exactly where vector databases come and do the trick. Basically, what we do is we take the query, we embed the query, and then we use that query to query the database, to query the vector database, and then we fetch the, the semantically relevant res uh, results that carry within it the meaning, again, that the user has within the intent of their query, and then we inject 
the content that has been associated with those embeddings into the context window of the LLM. So LLMs all have context windows that basically allow us to pour in some relevant information. It could come from anywhere, right? So you don't need to use just a vector database to put in content into those context, context windows. But the strength of a vector database is that it, it sort of gives us the, the, the guarantee that the content that we will put in there is going to be semantically relevant, right? And it's, it, we're going to have a greater chance of actually hitting that content because the query that we're going to use is going to handle all of this uh, uh, ambiguity for us because, again, we're in the semantic space where, space where we're looking at meaning and not at surface forms. So the, the architecture for RAG applications is twofold. First, we have our, uh, our so, sort of an ingestion step. So in this example, and this is the demo I'm going to show later, we have uh, sort of a system that looks at um, web content, that crawls that web content, and then we have the downstream process from that point on. And the, the downstream process after we ha actually have our content, which here is represented as web pages, is chunking. This is what we start with. This is where we start thinking about what are those portions of the data that are going to be useful th for the user when they query, right? So if, if for example, I'm thinking about uh, 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 indexing the documentation for my, for my uh, uh, company website, right, and I'm taking the FAQs, perhaps chunks are going to be uh, individual questions and the answers for those questions, right? And if I'm uh, um, uh, indexing a user manual, maybe the, the chunks are actually uh, chapters or paragraphs in chapters of that user manual because that's what makes the most sense to then retrieve and stuff into the context window. So after we've created those chunks, we have these documents that we, can, that we can now start embedding. And then the process from that point on is very similar to what I showed before with the semantic search. We use the vector embeddings and metadata. And we'll talk about exactly what that metadata could be in this, in this case. And then we insert it, we upsert it into the vector database. The other side, again, like I mentioned before, is again, we take the, the application sends over a query, we embed the query, we get our, our uh, we get the embeddings. Uh, sorry, this this is actually uh, uh, incorrect. Uh, here we only have the vector embeddings. We don't have a data. We have, we don't have the metadata. We have the that, that gets sent to the API to query, and then we take those results, stuff them into a context, and send them into the LLM that then streams those results back into our application. Okay, so there's a bunch of topics that I'm going to cover here um, in the time that I have left. Um, that I, I've, I've encountered and people have asked about a lot and I hope that they could be helpful for you if, if you're building a RAG application. Um, so we'll start with chunking considerations. So um, a lot of people are mystified by, by chunking. Um, there are a lot of ways to go about, um, about doing this. Um, and I think that you know, people are asking me like, a lot about you know, what's the perfect chunk size um, to use? Um, is it 512, is it 1024, or is it something completely different? Um, and the answer to this is there, that there is no answer uh, that is clear cut. Um, in most cases, I would personally recommend to stay away from uh, chunk sizes that are, um, uh, that are, that are fixed. Um, and that is because they may work in a lot of cases, but they probably are not taking into consideration the semantic information that may exist in the content that we are embedding. Right? So for example, if we are uh, embedding uh, web pages, um, there are many ways and many techniques to actually extract the semantic information that is inside of that web page, like headings and paragraphs and so on and so forth, to actually give our chunking uh, mechanism hints to where the, the content actually starts and ends semantically. What are the, 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 the sub-portions of the, of the document that are reasonable to chunk through? So, you, you really want to think about those type of, uh, type of things when you start thinking about um, how to chunk your, your application, your, your content. Um, 
and, and of course, that is like kind of the main, the main question is like, what, what exactly are you chunking, right? Like, are you chunking huge uh, uh, user manuals? Are you chunking an FAQ? Are you uh, chunking documents for a coding website? Um, that definitely influences the type of chunks that you're going to use and the, mech and the, and the techniques that are going to use to, to, to chunk them. So for example, if, you're, if you have a lot of code in your, in your, in your text, you wanna make sure that those chunks uh, contain strips of code that have a beginning and an end and you're not chunking right in the middle of them, right? Because that's gonna be um, obviously um, anti-productive. Um, you also wanna think about what embedding model um, you're using, right? So different embedding models are tuned to uh, deal with different lengths of content. So for example, sentence transfor transformers, as the name suggests, um, is best used for sentence level embeddings, whereas other um, uh, embedding uh, models like uh, 802 is, is, could be used for varying length, lengths of content and, 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 and really much longer uh, 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 sets of content. And so that will also inform the way that you chunk your, your data. Um, you, of course, want to, again, think about how users are going to query your data and what, what kind of information they want to get back, right? If, do we, do we want to make sure that like, they get very uh, laser-focused responses in the response, or do we want the responses to include as much, as, as much data as possible? And that, again, is going to inform, inform the length of the chunk that you're going to use and the reference within the metadata um, for each chunk. So for example, you could take, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, you can reference all, each chunk that you've created with the document that it was created from and actually use that parent document to be the, uh, the, the, the content that is going to be stuffed in the context, uh, in the context window. Um, and the last point here is uh, content aware versus pro programmatic, which is again, I, some, some just, I started talking about that, um, and that is you could either use um, uh, again, the, 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 the methods like, uh, like a markdown, split down, split, a splitter that will basically look at the actual content and do some, some sort of like a, an intelligent splitting, or you could use um, recursive splitting, which, just, will, which will programmatically just take chunks of your content, and in, in some cases that will work just fine. Okay, so um, this is, a, I started talking about it just now, um, parent document retrieval. This is an, another technique that um, has worked very well for a lot of a lot of people that we talk to. Um, so you start by chunking your documents. Um, <clears throat> each chunk references the original document, um, and then when we uh, when we query we query against the chunks. So we get the the, re the most relevant chunks that points to the parent document, and then we use the the parent document as the actual content for the context window um, to actually pr provide the answer. Um, another method is a multi-vector multi retrieval, um, and in this method, we can think about um, uh, creating vectors for, uh, uh, creating embeddings for chunks of different sizes. Um, so again, we can use this parent document method, so you can, uh, again, reference uh, a small chunk to a bigger chunk. We can also create summaries of our content, again, a condensed, condensed form of the, the material that we want to point to. Um, that's that's going to be the basis for the retrieval, and then uh, we get back the content that we want, or we can actually create and generate hypothetical questions for our content. Um, that's a very interesting way of actually getting better matches for ambiguous queries, um, where we don't exactly know what the best way to ask things about the content in the first place is going to be. Um, and we've seen really great, uh, great results using, the me using this method. Um, and when, again, the, the time to retrieve happens, we can retrieve uh, Again, th these vectors of, of varying lengths, whether we're using uh, filters to choose subsets of these varying lengths, or whether we just search throughout uh, the index for all of these different chunks, um, and then pick the best, uh, the best result uh, based on the confidence level of the, of the result um, to, use as our, uh, to use for the context window. Um, hybrid search is another method that um, a lot of people don't necessarily know about. Um, and that comes into play where we have um, highly domain-specific uh, data uh, and, and content um, within the domain that we're, within the content that we're indexing and, 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 and where, where we expect users to actually ask questions about those domain-specific things. And hybrid search basically applies um, a, a, dual mo a dual mode of search, as the name uh, suggests. So we create a dense embedding that uses a dense uh, uh, embedding model, um, like again, Ada2 
or any of the llamas, those are dense embeddings. And then we can also use a sparse embedding model like BM25, which basically preserves the keywords um, that, are, that, are, that, that are of interest within the corpus that we're uh, indexing. And in that way, we are basically covering for the fact that retrieval, that, that these retrieval, the embedding um, models might not know about our specific domain uh, terminology and the surface forms that um, are contained within it. And that's basically, uh, uh, basically assures that we, we can get better results uh, and more accurate results in those, uh, in those type of uh, cases. Right, um, so metadata is incredibly powerful um, for, for RAG and for using RAG in general. Um, we can we can start thinking about rag as like we can start thinking about metadata as again like the the the, the easiest way to start narrowing down and making our search results more uh, more accurate, right? So the first thing that you could do is apply some information from the application to again boil down exactly what the user is looking for, right? And that's kind of like, perhaps in some ways, kind of uh, going outside of like the uh, natural way of using RAG, but it's, it's, it's going to increase the, the, your ability to actually get accurate results. Then if you apply any of, these, any of these methods, in addition to using metadata, you can actually use it to, to, to do ranking, uh, boost, boost the rank of the results that you get um, based on the, the, the query and the result that you're getting. Um, and of course, you can use, uh, you can use uh, temporal relevance to, to, to basically weed out any, re any responses that might not be relevant due to time uh, constraints, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, and the last thing I wanna talk about before um, showing a tiny little demo and then taking some questions is monitoring and evaluation. So there's um, a bunch of tools out there. I'm, I'm gonna mention two of them now. Um, for doing uh, basic monitoring of performance of your uh, RAG applications. Um, Langsmith from Langchain is a wonderful, wonderful tool that you can basically instrument your, your chains and your vector store with. Um, again, if you're using Langchain, this is, this is trivial to do, but you don't have to use Langchain to use Langsmith. And then you can get a really good idea of how exactly your, um, your um, application is performing in terms of how many times it hit the store, how many times the uh, result was actually relevant, et cetera, et cetera. And Llama Index is actually uh, is, a, is a competitor to Langchain and offers a very similar mechanism, perhaps not as flashy, but it's, it's as, uh, is as uh, relevant. Um, latency is definitely something you wanna keep an eye on. Um, so again, if you're definitely, if you're, if you're uh, compounding all sorts of different uh, ranking, re-ranking methods within your, your, within the process of uh, responding to the user, you wanna be aware of that because the, the, the hardest thing to actually maintain is a very quick response from, from the server. As again, th this comes into play mostly when you're compounding different methods for uh, improving your results for RAG, like um, improving the query and improving and re-ranking the results. Um, and last but not least, of course, like it's very, very highly recommended that if you're building a RAG application, you'll have some sort of mechanism to collect uh, some user uh, uh, feedback to know whether or not the results that you gave are um, correct or accurate or not. Okay, so a quick demo. So this is a simple RAG application that we built. Um, so here on the here on the left, we just have a normal a normal LLM. This is OpenAI. This is just going to say hello. And then here on the right, um, we have this uh, sidebar where we basically have three web pages that we can choose from that um, will provide and basically go and crawl those web web pages and. Uh, uh, create the embeddings for, chunk those web pages into, into portions that make sense, and then embed them and upsert them into Pinecone. And then um, the, the, the next time that we're going to query the, the, the LLM after these um, uh, embeddings are created and saved in uh, Pinecone, the LLM should be able to respond with a relevant, uh, with a, with a relevant information. So we'll start with asking it about, I hope that you can see this. Maybe I should make this a little bit bigger. 
Um, I'm going to ask this about this uh, uh, athlete. I'm not going to try and, and, and say his name. Um, we're going to ask about how big his contract was. Um, and as you can see, uh, the LLM basically says, I'm sorry, but I don't have access to this real, real time information of or current events, which is what you'd expect an LLM to say when it doesn't know the answer to something that is relevant uh, to, to, again, uh, to some temporal information. So now I clicked on this, uh, on this article, and what you see here on the right is that I have now these chunks of, of text that are coming from, the, from this web page that may have the information that I'm looking for. Okay? So now I'm going to ask the exact same question again. And this time I get back the response that he signed a three-year contract for $33 million, but also I have a reference to the chunk that was relevant, right, for, to, to, back, to actually produce this, this answer. And this is exactly what I meant when I was talking about explainability, when, when the, uh, the, the, the model itself can't do that, right? Like it can't tell you what it's basing its response on, right? Because it doesn't have that notion at all, right? It has like an internal presentation of all the data that, that it saw before, and it can start generating the next, the next token. Right? But when we're giving it those trusted sources, the information that I say, yeah, I blessed that, and that is correct, right? now I can say I can actually point to that data and tell my user, if you want references for this particular answer that the model has uh, generated for you, here they are. And that's it. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'd love to hear them. Um, also, everybody's invited for our Pinecone uh, dinner and beer at 5.30. Um, come see us at our, at our booth for more detail. And that's it. Thank you so much. Awesome. We have a question right over here. Hello. Uh, so when it comes, the first question is about uh, RAG technique. Firstly, if my vec vector database that I create uh, is something huge, uh, the domain specific chatbot that I want to create uh, is like the domain itself is a is very big. Maybe it is related to coding or healthcare. So if the vector database is huge, uh, will we face any problems with the accuracy with which the answers the answers that are being generated by our chatbot? And what is the latency issue that we may face? So I'll start with the second answer. <laughs> if you're using Pinecone, you could expect latency under 100 milliseconds for most queries. Um, for the first question, um, in terms of accuracy, it really depends on what you're going to actually index, right? Um, and how people are going to ask questions about what you've indexed, right? So it's completely dependent on the, what the, the, the breadth of the content that you've created, and also about how you chunk that content to begin with. Right? So if you've created, for example, tiny little chunks of one sentence each, right? you might get like, a response that might look relevant, but not, might, be, might not be sufficient for a user to find accurate and, and satisfying. Right? On the other hand, if you create really, really long documents, right, you might get you know, all the relevant data, but too much data, and that's not exactly what the user asked. Right? And so you want to find like a, a, an area in between, right, which will be sort of like the, an ideal sized chunk that will contain data that will be relevant for a user's query. Right? And that's not an easy feat, but there are, again, like I said, multiple techniques to achieve that. And then you want to have a big enough breadth of information that will cover the things that you expect your users to ask. Because usually what happens is the user comes to your website, your website is about coding, and they're going to say, how do I, where do I, where do I, can I find the cheapest Volvo? I, you know, I don't know. Um, so you have to have like the, sort of setting that expectation that the user knows what is the scope that is relevant for your, for your, for your bot. And there are, again, ways to do some uh, prompt engineering to make sure that when users ask questions that are outside of that scope, the bot will basically uh, tell them, hey, I can't answer that. I have a question about the, like, um, for the hallucination. So you mentioned that fixing hallucination, like for example, if uh, you talk a lot about chunking and uh, embedding. So suppose now for the retriever side, the accuracy you cannot get 100%. Uh, we have like, maybe 90%. Then there's still 10% that the context is wrong. So in this case, 
how can we fix hallucination? So I think the dem in the demo, what you showed it first of all is that, I'm sorry, I don't have access to something, something. That's good, instead of a hallucination. So like from the database side, is there any way or any metric tell us, hey, I didn't find the context actually, uh, so I don't want to hallucination. Mm. So is there any way to do that? Yeah, I mean, if the content is wrong, you're kind of in the hole, right? Because it, the, the, the basic premise, right, and that's what I said before, that the content that we've embedded and use in our knowledge base is trusted by us, right? So we've said, this is correct. Right? If, if we're starting from that point, then we can say, like, from that point on, trust, trust is there, right? But if we don't trust the content to begin with, right, then it's a different set of problems, right? Like, then you have to figure out how to clean out, you know, the noise from the actual signal within your content. And I think that kind of falls outside of the scope of this particular talk. I, I hope that makes sense. He is, he is at the booth out there, though, right, for the rest of today and yeah. probably tomorrow, Tomorrow too. as well, yeah. Yep. So feel free to ask more questions if you would like. Thank you.